we're going to have a look at Lammas Hiling today and uh, let's start with the title. The title is obviously the Lammas Hiling there and it's just part of August, it's uh, early August and it's actually when farmers would hire men to bring in the harvest and so that's what it's talking about. So at Lammas time, farmers would go in and they would hire men, hirelings, uh, to work on the farm to actually bring in the harvest. But it's obviously very archaic, it's not a phrase that we would hear today, is it? So it's immediately setting the poem in the past. Definitely, I think actually that is part of the characteristic of uh, the poet here. I think actually he writes a lot about folklore and uh, you see that in a lot of the natural imagery that's been used throughout the poem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the start you can see immediately that he had a light heart, so the, the, the farmer himself is actually you know really quite merry at the start and so obviously he's doing pretty well. And he's looking for his hireling and at the moment he's got a heavy purse, he's got lots of money but he struck so cheap so there's like a little bit of suspicion at the start, why is this person willing to work for so little money? So this is like initially why we might actually start to suspect something's wrong with the hireling here for not asking for too much money. Yeah, I've written down that there's a mystery about that and also the fact that he struck so cheap, we're wondering who is he, um, we're not giving a great deal of information about him. So that also just arouses your curiosity. I think the sounds are really nice at the beginning of the poem, well, throughout the poem, actually, but the um, the vowel sounds, or maybe the consonants too, I'd still a light heart and a heavy purse. It's a very sort of jaunty, upbeat rhythm. Um, things are going well, and you can hear it through the sounds. Um, and then the sounds become richer, I think, on the third and fourth line when he's talking about how fertile things are in the hireling's presence, the cattle doted on him, uh, the repetition of the T sounds and the, the heavy vowels doted on him in his time. There are lots of echoes, the him and the time and mine. Um, so it, it all sounds really fecund, really fertile. And I love the simile at the end. That is cream. That is cream. Definitely. They're very healthy and long as, you know, profitably large is what I've put down there. Mm. And then in isolation afterwards, because we're talking about just how nice three and four, line three mm -hmm. and four are, but then in line five you've got yields doubled and you've got that really kind of dramatic short sentence yeah, there. Yeah, very emphasised, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's almost stilted. It's nice and flowing, as you say. It's got a really nice like rhythm to the start and then yields doubled is in isolation and it's kind of harsh. Well, is there something wrong with yields doubling? Mm -hmm. And then he moves on to, I grew fond of company that knew when to shut up which it, it almost seems like there's an element of resentment there. So Yeah, it's I, very I say, rude, isn't it? New when yeah. to shut up. It's quite a direct term. Definitely. Um, and it suggests that there's something going on in the power dynamic here between the pair of them, the farmer and his employee. Yeah. Definitely. You know, is he upset because the employee is making the heifers so as cream mm. and that they're doting on him? Does he want that kind of relationship with his own animals? Okay, so a hint of jealousy, maybe. Certainly. Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it's interesting the way the form, because um, we've got the four neat stanzas, which apparently look like, make it look like everything's organised, but the punctuation doesn't run neatly, isn't contained neatly within those stanzas. So the, no. then one night introduces an element of suspense, and we sort of sense that this story is going to become more complicated. And the fact that that thrusts disturbed to the beginning of the second sentence, I think immediately changes the tone of the second stanza, sorry. Completely. Um, yeah. I okay. mean... So you've got like the night there, obviously, and yeah, it mm. is disturbed earlier on uh, in the second stanza, but then also it's it's contrasting this really kind of like positive, bright, light heart that he's got at the start. And so, yeah, it is like at the end, you've got this like also in isolation over here, the very final part, the, the last stanza, where actually something's going wrong all of a sudden. And then, yeah, you do get this disturbed from dreams of uh, mm. my dear late wife. Yeah, so suddenly we have death being introduced as well. Um, and if this is becoming quite gothic with the nighttime setting, disturbing dreams, um, a deceased partner, yeah. Um, yeah, so cer certainly the tone has changed quite dramatically. Uh, quite quickly. Now he's um, a predator. Yeah. I hunted down and the sort of synesthesia I think is the term here for torn voice because torn is something physical and voice is something that you listen to. Yeah. Um, so there's that mixed, strange mixing of sensations and senses 
which um, again makes this scene a bit more disturbing, I think. Definitely. And I think, you know, the idea of him being a hunter there, which mm. works really quite nicely with the vulnerability of his pale form as well. Does which, that make you think of ghosts? Pale forms? Oh, certainly, yeah. Ghostly? I think it's quite gothic in its imagery, yeah, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. And the interesting thing, obviously, is it seems like ghostly and unnatural, the pale form, he's standing out in the night time as well. So he's the one that actually contrasts this darkness, and it seems like he's almost superhuman at this particular moment. Mm. That's also interesting, the light from the dark lantern. Yeah. That adjective dark there is unusual, isn't it? Because a lantern normally projects light, so dark lantern... Yeah, and it's almost like he's drawing the light from the dark lantern almost. Mm. So I've said that, you know, you've got some kind of antithesis here. The light in the dark, it shows just how abnormal this is. And what's going on is yeah. unnatural and something yeah, strange is going yeah. on. Yeah, and I noticed this time through that we've got all these compound adjectives. The stock stills, dark naked, fox trap. Um, what do you think the effect of those is? Is it creating a sort of a very... Um, definite sense here stock still stark naked is it drawing attention to just how still just how naked i think so i think they're really kind of harsh stock still it's not just still he's actually mm. completely immovable mm -hmm. and then stark naked obviously capturing that vulnerability in the night that you can actually see but also it's a real contrast to the night that's surrounding him mm -hmm. and then we have the aggression of the fox trap biting his ankle, the personification there of the trap, sort of attacking the hireling. He's suddenly gone from being very successful to becoming a total victim, hasn't he? Totally, yeah, absolutely. I think actually that works really quite nice with, um, like if you looked at earlier when it talks about the cattle doting on him, well, the natural elements dote on him and like him, mm -hmm. whereas actually down here when it talks about the fox trap, this is the man-made element mm. that he's not actually successful with. So when right. it comes to the fox trap, um, actually biting his ankle, it's almost as if the aggression is all from man-made human The human elements. world, yeah. And then suddenly it goes very strange. I knew him a warlock, a warlock so a wizard, so something unnatural, super, supernatural. A cow with leather horns, which apparently is, is a hare. Is a hare. Yeah. Who knew? Um, in, <laughs> yeah. in, what in folklore. Sort of folklore, right, yeah. okay. A cow with leather horns equates to a hare. Yeah. And then this phrase here, to go into the hare, so the idea of transforming into a hare is going to get you muckle sorrow. Um, that sounds quite Scottish to me, muckle. Um, a great deal of sorrow. Yeah. So it is definitely, so you've got like a lot of sorrow to go into the hair to actually be this warlock, to be this wizard, to actually transform into something else. Um, we'll get you a lot of sorrow, but does he mean like a lot of sorrow for the warlock itself? Or mm -hmm. does he mean actually for those around him, those around him, even the farmer himself here? Mm. Well, that certainly turns out to be the case, doesn't it? That it's for the farmer. Certainly. So you, you've got here that this is actually, um, the poet has selected lines from a Robert Graves poem. Yeah, it's a restoration of a witch chant. So Robert Graves restored some witch chanting um, into an actual poetic form. And it talks about chasing down warlocks or chasing down wizards, people that transform in, um, into different animals throughout the poem. And sort of shapeshifters. Yeah, right? shapeshifters. Okay. And they're chased down by seemingly more virtuous animals, nicer types oh, of animals. Okay. And they're mm -hmm. always, always going to be brought back. Um, and they're always going to face this, I don't know, uh, ultimate end, basically. They've got something to atone for and they're going to be asked to answer for it in the poem. So it is like a reference more to folklore. And that's where he gets like the phrase to go into the hair gets you muckle sorrow, muckle joy, or muckle sorrow, muckle care, sorry. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of that basically is telling you that if you are a warlock, you, you've got consequences to face, it's going to bring you some kind of consequence. That, yeah. Right, okay. And the wisdom runs because it was generally received, it was common knowledge that this would be the case. Yeah. So, yeah, we, we actually need help with that, but. Um, previous generations might have had a greater understanding of that.
And what about the farmer's action now? I levelled and blew the small owl through his heart. Yeah, he kills him. Basically. <laughs> That's it, definitely. Yeah, pretty brutal. Yeah. Uh, and blew the small hour, the small hour of the night through his heart, essentially. It's not it's... odd phrasing, though, isn't it? Yeah. Don't you think? I blew the small hour through his heart. So you definitely get the sense of a shot being fired and killing somebody. But is it a euphemism uh, rather than saying, I killed him? Um, is he suggesting that because it is the small hours of the night it took him a very small amount of time to decide what to do um, or is mm. it a euphemism as you say like trying to dress up the facts that he's actually been a committed murder Yeah. but interestingly it has a reaction in the natural world so after he has killed the warlock or hireling um, the moon came out and in gothic fiction uh, when the moon comes out, that tends to be a precursor to other supernatural events. Yeah. Um, and that's going to be the case here. By its yellow witness, what did you think of the adjective yellow there? I think yellow there, it's yellow witness there. It, it almost seems like it's sickly. Yeah, I agree. It's not got nice connotations, has it? No, absolutely. I think actually the yellow sickness, it's almost if life has got some kind of filter to it now and everything is shrouded in sickness, which mm -hmm. will definitely be reflected later on in the poem. And so it seems unnatural still, despite the fact that we're using natural imagery of the moon here. Mm -hmm. And I can see here that you've written you quite like this simile about That's him furring story. over like a stone mossing. Yeah. That suggests that the time is being speeded up because a stone would moss really slowly, ordinarily. Yeah, definitely. So that's also part of the unnatural events. Yeah, I think mean, it's this wonderful simile, but essentially like a, a stone mossing, he's furring over, he's turning back into that hair-like mm -hmm. form, so he's gone from this stock still stark naked human form and he is turning now into the warlock and maybe this is where he gets his muckle sorrow because he's obviously dying he's obviously been shot through his heart and so yeah like a stone moss in he's obviously getting smaller and smaller all the while and he's turning into that hair there which is a lovely mm. simile um and what about the next phrase his lovely head thin lovely stands out for me there why did he have a lovely head so maybe it reflects earlier on in the poem, he struck so I mean, there's something attractive to him, mm. not just as a human, like when it was earlier on, when he was striking that bargain to the work for so little money. But now, actually, there is something quite nice about his form. There is something quite aesthetically pleasing about the hair that he's turning into. Is it the hair he's turning into, or is it his previous form? Because his lovely head thinned. So I read that as what was lovely when he was a hireling is now transforming. Uh -huh. Um, I did read somewhere that someone was implying that um, there was possibly some form of attraction between the farmer and the hireling. Yeah. Uh, if you pick up the, he's disturbed from dreams of his dear late wife and the fact that he says he's got a lovely head. Um, so could this be a poem about the farmer's guilt? Is that why he killed him? It's because he uh, wanted to suppress those feelings he had for him? It perhaps could be, yes, certainly. I've never read it like that, definitely, but it, it would work, wouldn't it? So he might find him attractive, and by calling it his lovely head thinning, he's seeing it wasting away, maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, he's kind of upset at that imagery. Yeah, possibly. I think that's very graphic, that his top lip gathered, his eyes rose like bread. I find that quite disturbing, um, the notion of somebody's eyes suddenly popping out, swelling out of their head. It's, uh, yeah, that is um, very unnatural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not pleasant. No. Um, and then we have the farmer's action, what he decides to do. I carried him in a sack that grew lighter at every step. So um, very, uh, that defies the laws of physics. Why would a, a sack grow lighter at every step unless it had a hole in it? And dropped him from a bridge. Um, that's a brutal act. Certainly, he's getting rid of like that evidence, isn't he? So he wants to get rid of any evidence of his uh, well action with the the hireling right here. And if it's getting lighter at every step, I suggest maybe he's weighing less as he's transforming into the hair oh, because okay. he's getting smaller and smaller. It's almost as if he's wasting away right. in that sack whilst mm -hmm. he goes from human into his into hair his form. Animal form, yeah. So there is a sense of shame or guilt on the farmer's part. Definitely. Do you think he wants to hide the evidence? He wants to dispose of the body. Yeah. Um, and then there's the supernatural 
There was no splash. And I love the way that that's written over the line. Absolutely, um, yeah. So splash is delayed, we're waiting to, and it doesn't come, yeah. Yeah, definitely, it distances it, but yeah, as you say, it doesn't come, so he's put it down onto the next line with that enchantment mm -hmm. there, which works really quite nice. And then obviously you've got that says Euro directly after the splash, that full stop, which mm -hmm. makes us pause because we're waiting for it, but it doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's right. Um, and now the farmer's left with all sorts of problems. His herd's elf shot, so yeah. that means they're not thriving, they're not... So it was um, in the 18th and the 19th century, um, a common belief actually that cattle that were, uh, were sickly, so mm -hmm. a herd of cattle that were sickly, if they were pockmarked or looked like they were diseased, that actually it was the case of um, elves were shooting them with those and arrows and... Uh, and that was causing them to grow ill, basically. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, a result of his fortune, his change in fortune here, you can definitely see it. It's his herd's elf shot, where earlier they were only dropping heifers, they were fat as cream. Well, now mm -hmm. you've unfortunately got this really kind of sickly herd that is probably the consequences of his actions. And maybe we do get this sense of regret. Maybe he's done the wrong thing. Maybe he was too quick at leveling his gun at this uh, this hireling and blowing the small hour for his heart. Yeah, in that sense it really reminds me of the rhyme of the ancient mariner where the mariner shoots the albatross and as soon as he shoots the albatross the wind drops and he is left stranded in the middle of the ocean. Um, yes, and he needs to sort of atone for his sins until he can move on. Definitely, and you get that here as well, don't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. So, I mean there is this also, this sense of paranoia, so I don't dream where he actually, he was Dreaming, dreaming earlier before, on of his dear yeah. late wife, so mm -hmm. it, it seemed right before he's actually, before he actually killed the hireling, and so now here he can't dream, but instead, presumably because he can't sleep though as well. I don't well, dream. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. he spends his night, so he can't dream. So, but he also can't sleep because in his mm -hmm. night times he's actually casting ball from half crown. So, mm -hmm. he's not worried or concerned about money anymore. He's not worried probably no. about his cattle and his herd and just how fat they are, how they drop heifers anymore. Well, in this case, he's more concerned with turning the, those coins into shops that, that he can actually yeah, shoot so... with. So that paranoia, or maybe he's going to get a visitation from another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. warlock, somebody that's going to exact revenge for what he's done to this warlock, this hireling. So in this line he's concerned um, on a bodily level, mm. he's protecting his himself um, and then in the final lines of the poem we find out that this is a confessional. Um, yeah. He acknowledges I have sinned, it's been an hour since my last confession which is no time at all so he's totally racked with guilt yeah. and he is spending his time trying to atone for it and well he's he's certainly um confessing yeah and it's interesting here i mean this is the most structured line of the entire poem or the most structured part of the entire poem at least bless me father i have sinned this like faith is uh something that is providing a structure to his life as well maybe mm, giving him a purpose yeah yeah um, so we're left um, not in a very positive place, aren't we? We're left with a, a dead hireling um, and a traumatised farmer. Yeah. So it's a very haunting poem. Yeah. Um, possibly a cautionary tale? Yeah, I should the, think so. The dangers of the supernatural world? Yeah, and crossing darker arts, darker powers, mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.